Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, July 14th, we discuss the implications of the latest Congressional Review Act disapprovals. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Mr. Todd Gaziano and Professor Jonathan Adler. Todd Gaziano is Chief of Legal Policy and Strategic Research and Director for the, Se the Separation of Powers at Pacific Legal Foundation. His legal career includes positions in all three branches of the federal government, a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and as a think tank scholar. Todd was subcommittee chief counsel for the Regulatory Reform Subcommittee that Federalist Society founder David McIntosh chaired in the mid-1990s. And of note, particularly today, David McIntosh was the principal house sponsor of the Congressional Review Act 25 years ago. Todd is also an executive committee member of both the Federalism and Separation of Powers and the Civil Rights Practice Groups with the Federalist Society. Professor Jonathan Adler is the Johann Verheij Memorial Professor of Law and Director of the Coleman P. Burke Center for Environmental Law at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, where he teaches courses in environmental, administrative, and constitutional law. Professor Adler is the author or editor of seven books, and he's also a regular contributor to National Review Online and a regular contributor to the Bullock Conspiracy blog. We're very pleased to welcome you both to our event this afternoon, and we're looking forward to this discussion. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to the audience for questions. Please enter questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask a question orally, then please press the raise your hand button, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Otherwise, please enter those questions in the Q&A and you can enter those questions at any time. With that, thank you for being with us today. Todd, the floor is yours. Well, thank you much. And thanks everyone for uh, joining uh, Jonathan and me and Evelyn. Um, Jonathan and I in our opening are going to try to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the Federal, of the Congressional Review Act, but I think most um, viewers and listeners uh, know that. Um, we're gonna spend a little more time on two other uh, topics. Uh, one, uh, why it was used relatively less frequently in uh, this year than it was four years ago and what that means for the future. And we're also going to talk about the three rules that were overturned this year. Uh, the, the, there were three rules that were issued uh, near the end of the Trump administration um, that were uh, recently disapproved and signed, that disapproval was signed by Biden. So those are now three laws um, enacted under the Congressional Review Act. So to begin um, on our refresher course on the Congressional Review Act, um, and we won't go into the excruciating detail we have, I think, at other times, um, it's a law that requires agencies to submit all of their rules, and that's broadly defined rules, including almost all guidance documents, to Congress before they can go into effect. Uh, major rules have to be um, delayed in their effectiveness an extra 30 days for Congress to consider um, expedited procedures that the Congressional Review Act uh, grants um, the Congress to consider disapproving individual rules. So the main expedited procedure uh, of significance anyway, is that for a period of 60 session days, or legislative days, depending on the House of Congress, but for that period, particularly in the Senate, um, the filibuster doesn't apply to these specialized uh, resolutions of disapproval. So many um, participants will remember that there were 15 rules uh, disapproved four years ago in 2017 that were issued at the end of the Obama administration. And one more a year later uh, that had not been submitted uh, to Congress. So there was a total of 15 um, in 2017 and one more in 2018. And so the same sort of political alignment, except in reverse, um, existed at the beginning of this year. And uh, the Congress only uh, overturned uh, uh, three regulations. 
Um, there's, there's a few reasons why um, Susan Dudley and I in a program predicted there might be fewer uh, rules overturned this year, um, but I actually lost my bet and happily, I think, lost my bet that not as many uh, were overturned as I still thought there would be. But I'm going to throw out one reason that Susan Dudley and I discussed even then um, would make it likely that this current Congress and administration would be somewhat more reluctant to use the Congressional Review Act. And then Jonathan is going to add some of his thoughts on that uh, before we talk about the three rules that were overturned. And the main reason is that the Congressional Review Act has a pro automatic provision that says that the agency that issued an overturned rule uh, cannot issue one that is substantially the same, that's the term in the statute, ever again without congressional authorization in a statute. And a deregulatory Congress or administration might not be afraid of that. And so four years ago, uh, the Congress that overturned those 15 and 16 rules weren't particularly concerned, but there was concern by a more pro-regulatory Congress and administration that the bar on substantially similar rules uh, might prevent the agency from issuing um, stronger rules. And when we talk about the, the three rules that were overturned in the past month, uh, we can actually discuss why they, Congress wasn't worried about those particular rules. Um, but there was some discussion uh, among activists, among members of Congress and others um, that they were um, somewhat reluctant uh, to use the CRA because of the bar. And the, the last point uh, related to this I'll, I'll raise is that only one rule that's ever been overturned uh, was reissued. And it was one that involved drug testing um, uh, for unemployment recipients. Uh, rule, by the way, I don't know very well. Um, but it was uh, reissued only recently. And no court has ever um, in, attempted to interpret what the bar on substantially similar rules were. Now, when the um, Trump administration uh, reissued the rule, the rule itself did make findings as to or statement as to why it was um, substantially different or not substantially similar uh, to the one that was overturned. And I think Jonathan agrees with me that that's a good practice, but I'll, I'll turn it over to him uh, to discuss uh, that and related issues. Thanks, Todd. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Happy to talk about uh, the Congressional Review Act. Um, and, you know, I, I like, like you, Todd, and, and like Susan, um, I did not expect um, that the Congressional Review Act would get uh, as much use uh, this year as it did in 2017. And I think there, there are a bunch of reasons for that. And I think there are a bunch of reasons more broadly um, that the Congressional Review Act has been used thus far uh, more often by uh, Republican Congresses and Republican administrations to undo Democratic rules or rules adopted under Democratic administrations uh, than the reverse. Um, one reason that I think is just the broader political context and understanding of the law, that the Congressional Review Act was adopted in a, on a bipartisan way, it was signed into law by President Clinton, but it is viewed as having an anti-regulatory bias. Um, uh, the idea here is that Congress delegates authority to agencies uh, to use their technical expertise to develop regulations that Congress recognizes it doesn't have the knowledge and expertise to do itself, and that a CRA, CRA resolution somehow undoes that deal. It, it counters that delegation. Now, CRA supporters will say, well, that's democratic accountability. That's assure, ensuring that the unelected folks at the agencies aren't adopting regulations that don't have a political support, that aren't supported by the legislature that empowered the agency to adopt those regulations. Uh, but CRA critics and certainly some groups that uh, tend to uh, support a broader federal regulation view this as having a, an, an anti-regulatory bias because it will primarily be used for anti-regulatory purposes. And, and as a consequence, there are there are groups, uh, uh, various progressive groups that, that to this day uh, argue that uh, the Congressional Review Act should be repealed. 
And some of these groups have acknowledged, uh, I think, the political reality uh, that once a, a law has been used in both directions, once it's been used by both sides, especially a, a procedural rule or procedural law like the Congressional Review Act, a law that creates processes that can be used uh, uh, to undo actions taken by a prior administration, that that gives it a broader legitimacy. It cements its place into the firmament of administrative law. And uh, you can find on Twitter and on various websites arguments made by uh, various groups warning that, that, that that's a consequence of a Democratic Congress uh, using the Congressional Review Act to undo uh, regulations that have been adopted by a Republican administration. I think as a practical matter, it's also worth noting that you know, for regulations to be vulnerable, they have to be adopted near the end of an administration. And uh, the Bush administration um, uh, was somewhat more careful than either the Clinton administration or the Obama administration or even the Trump administration had been about limiting the number of rules that are, were issued in that period of time that would make them vulnerable to repeal under the Congressional Review Act. The, the number of midnight regu uh, regulations was fewer. When Susan Dudley was uh, running the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, she certainly made an effort to constrain the amount of uh, midnight rulemaking that occurred. And so there were just fewer opportunities when the Obama administration came into office, uh, whereas when the Trump administration came in now, there were more potential targets. And so in some respects, this was the first time that a new Democratic administration really had even to face the question of, do we uh, try and repeal some of these rules uh, or do we not? The other issue that... Um, uh, or, or, the, the, what I think has convinced at least some members of Congress and some progressive groups that the CRA was important to use is their consideration of the alternative, that uh, the process of undoing a regulation generally requires doing just as much as was done to put that, that regulation in place in the first place. If you had to go through notice and comment rulemaking to adopt the rule, you generally are going to have to go through notice and comment regulation to undo that rule, and that can be very time consuming. That can be very resource intensive. And so for a new administration that wants to work quickly, um, the Congressional Review Act has this play, can play this role of clearing the decks, of kind of moving some stuff out of the way, getting rid of the prior administration's policies so that the new administration can focus on developing its new policies rather than undoing those of its predecessor. And I think especially in the wake of the Supreme Court's DACA decision, which I think really cemented the idea that there is no shortcut to, to altering the policy of your predecessor. In fact, uh, you may have an added obligation to account for things like reliance interests, even if you believe your predecessor's actions were, un were unlawful, as had been the, uh, had been the case with, with DACA. Um, that, that I think added some steam to those that wanted to use the CRA. Uh, Todd mentioned that the, the the legal bar in the Congressional Review Act. And as he noted, we, we don't have a judicial precedent or just judicial interpretation of that language. Uh, my own view is that the, the Congressional Review Act provision, what I think of as an anti-circumvention provision, uh, is relatively narrow and is likely to be interpreted fairly narrowly by courts uh, if and when it, the question arises. Um, you know, the primary purpose of this is to prevent uh, Congress from having to play whack-a-mole with a recalcitrant agency, right? So Congress repeals the regulation. The agency can't just pop the regulation back into place and force Congress to repeal it again. Um, uh, but an agency adopting a new rule uh, that adopts a new approach to the same subject matter shouldn't really be precluded by uh, the Congressional Review Act because it requires uh, that the, the new rule not be substantially the same. And, and we, can, we can all imagine other language that could have been used in the, in the Congressional Review Act that would have had much broader preemptive effect. Um, so I think the concerns that a CRA resolutions would preclude the Biden administration from adopting new regulations on those various subjects uh, were overstated. But I think as a, a practical political matter, uh, those concerns did result in uh, Congress uh, looking more narrowly at what possible Trump administration rules uh, to repeal. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we only have three uh, resolutions to talk about as opposed to uh, the 15 or so that we saw at the beginning of the Trump administration. And I'll turn it back to you, Todd. 
Well, thanks. And and I agree with everything Jonathan said. I'll just put a, a minor gloss on it, on a couple of them. Um, one is I wasn't um, maybe I wasn't clear in my opening, but the now the time for the Senate's expedited procedure without the filibuster for rules issued in the Trump administration is over. So that's why we're having this program today, because we know the universe of rules that um, can be used, that can use those expedited procedures. It is still conceivable, however, that there will be a rule issued by an independent agency or something like that, that, that Congress and this administration will want to pick up. But another um, gloss on what Jonathan says is I I also agreed publicly and, and again today that the bar doesn't need to be, um, the bar on issuing a substantially similar rule doesn't need to prohibit most other rulemaking, except that the legislative history noted it depends on the underlying statute and the authority that the um, agency, original agency had. Um, sometimes Congress passes a statute that gives the agency effectively a binary choice, or sometimes the agency pretends that the statute does. And in issuing an original rule, it says we have no other choice other than to issue this rule. The statute leaves us no choice, it constrains us. And the, one of the purposes of the Congressional Review Act was to you know, raise the stakes of that kind of statute made me do it kind of uh, regulating and that um, the more important constraint is whether the statute really does give the agency a binary choice. But in that, that narrow set of regulatory um, uh, constraints, uh, it is possible that an agency would be left with no or virtually no discretion. But in most cases where Congress is giving far too broad delegation to the agencies to regulate, um, they can probably um, find other ways of regulating um, uh, even in the face of a rule that's been overturned. Um, in any event, I think uh, we're going to divide up the three rules to talk about how it played out this spring and why the concern about substantially similar may have not overridden uh, Congress's desire to zap them. Um, and I'm going to talk about one and Jonathan's going to talk about two. And the one I'm going to talk about is the EOC's um, conciliation rule. And one reason why um, the current Congress and the administration didn't like it, um, and uh, in many other areas, it was at least possible for their own agency, their own appointees uh, to undo it. Um, and uh, Jonathan mentioned that it takes a lot more work, but that's actually what they're doing, or they seem to be doing um, with most other rulemaking. But the EEOC is a quasi-independent agency. Some think it's independent agency, um, but it is currently headed by uh, more Republican appointees than Democrat appointees. So it's a three-two. So for those people who didn't like the EEOC conciliation rule, there was no um, immediate option, at least, for the EEOC to overturn it. Uh, as far as what that rule did, um, the Title VII and a number of other civil rights statutes require um, the uh, uh, complainant and the EOC to engage in a conciliation process. And some of the uh, firms that were subject to the conciliation process had argued that EOC was engaging in what amounted to a shakedown process without giving them enough factual basis in which to um, understand the nature of the, the complaint without telling them whether the complaint was a pattern in practice or an individual, what the facts of the complaint are, what made them conclude that uh, the law had been violated. And so uh, based on that concern, uh, the EOC conciliation rule um, issued a proposed and then final rule near the end of the Trump administration, um, arguing that uh, providing a requiring a little bit more information to be provided would increase the likelihood that conciliation would settle the claim. And that is obviously the goal of the civil rights statutes that require conciliation. And for example, it required that they state the sort of factual basis of the claim, um, if it wasn't privileged, um, who the complainants were, what type of claim it was, what the legal basis was, and to provide 
the um, uh, complainant a little additional time uh, to determine whether they should settle or not. Um, well, apparently uh, Congress thought that those sort of bare bones, uh, sort of factual disclosures were too much for the uh, EEOC. Uh, I think you can tell that I was a supporter of the rule and thought that the uh, complaints that somehow it it biased, the rule biased the conciliation process in favor of the firms was um, uh, not well, well, uh, well pled or well well argued, but as a result of the disapproval, um, I suppose maybe another thought about whether the substantially similar rule, um, cons whether the bar on substantially similar rules was a concern to those in Congress who are overturning it. Apparently, they thought the agency had free reign to engage in shakedowns, and that uh, there wasn't really a uh, a worry that uh, the EEOC needed a rule to justify its prior procedures. So that's my um, explanation of what the rule actually did and, and why I think um, Congress was unconcerned with the judicial bar, I mean, with the bar on substantially similar rules. And so with that, Jonathan, um, hopefully you can describe the other two. Sure. So I'm uh, happy to talk about, about, about the other two rules. Um, the first of the other two rules, it was called uh, the true lender rule, which had been adopted by uh, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And uh, this rule was, uh, uh, depend what it did really depends on uh, which side of, of the debate over that rule you were. According to the Trump administration, according to supporters of the rule, uh, what it did is it clarified uh, who constituted the lender for various loan arrangements and had the effect of uh, making it easier for uh, fintech companies and other uh, newer firms to enter into partnerships with nationally regulated banks to offer uh, various financial services, uh, including loans. Uh, and uh, this, that this had the effect, among other things, of making credit uh, more available uh, to a wider array of consumers. Um, to critics, uh, this a lot made it easier for payday lenders or those who might uh, charge a higher interest rates to evade state level regulation that limits uh, limit the type the amount of interest that may be charged uh, on various loans and other state level regulation, uh, and therefore was a protect consumer the, the rule got in the way of consumer protection. I don't for purposes of, of our discussion, I don't think it's important to to get in the way or the biggest side of this debate, but it's important to understand that this is a long-standing debate about credit markets, uh, about whether or not um, uh, allowing less regulation and allowing a wider array of loan instruments in particular is good for consumers uh, because it gives consumers more legal alternatives uh, if they need uh, to obtain uh, uh, money, need, need short-term loans, uh, versus those that are concerned that in some cases, the terms of those loans uh, might be uh, unfair to consumers in particular because the interest rates uh, are too high. And what the Trump administration rule had done is it had, it had clarified who would be uh, the lender and made it easier for um, uh, those that are in partnerships with banks to uh, make the nationally regulated bank uh, the lender for purposes of federal regulation and its preemption of at least uh, some state regulation. Uh, Congress repealing this rule effectually has the effect of eliminating the certainty and this essentially the safe harbor uh, for these sorts of arrangements uh, and likely will have the effect of um, uh, making it more difficult for fintech firms in particular to innovate and develop loan products in this space. Uh, so that was one of the, the other two other other two rules that Congress uh, repealed with the CRA. Uh, the third one um, is one that I think is particularly significant and and maybe I say that because I focus on, on environmental regulation. And so I, of course, will think that the environmental regulation is the particularly significant one. Uh, but I want to explain why uh, the Trump administration's methane rule uh, and its repeal by the Congressional Review Act is, I think, quite significant, uh, not merely for regulatory policy, but also for how we think about the Congressional Review Act. So here, uh, the Obama administration had adopted a rule under the Clean Air Act regulating methane emissions from oil and gas development and from new oil and gas 
uh, developments. And this was part of the Obama administration's efforts to control uh, greenhouse gases. And methane is a particularly potent uh, greenhouse gas. And once the Obama administration realized that uh, it was not going to be able to get a new uh, greenhouse gas regulation bill through Congress, it looked at various ways it could try and use existing statutory authority to adopt new regulations limiting greenhouse gases. And this methane rule uh, was one of the more uh, significant ones that the Obama administration adopted. Uh, this rule was something the Trump administration uh, targeted very early on, uh, but it took the Trump administration a substantial amount of time to come up with a replacement. Uh, and it took them about three and a half years. Um, and that I think highlights uh, the, the underlying the background that we have to consider when thinking about the Congressional Review Act that for complex regulations, it can take a long time to go through the, the notice and comment rulemaking process. It took the Trump administration almost the entirety of its first term to undo an Obama rule and come up with a replacement, a replacement that both lessened the stringency uh, of the regulation of emissions uh, from oil and gas development, changed the way that um, uh, emissions would be identified for regulation. And, and we can get into the technical aspects of that if, if folks are interested. Uh, but basically, the Trump rule wasn't going to focus on methane as methane as much as methane as a type of volatile organic compound that can otherwise be subject to regulation under the Clean Air Act. The Trump administration also adopted an interpretation of some of the language in the Clean Air Act that had the purpose and effect of making it more difficult for the Environmental Protection Agency going forward uh, to justify new regulations targeting greenhouse uh, gas emissions of various sorts. And, and this combination of, of what the Trump administration did made this rule uh, a particularly attractive target to environmental organizations, uh, even to environmental organizations that, are, that historically have been somewhat suspicious of the Congressional Review Act uh, seeing it as a primarily deregulatory tool, as we've already talked about. In this case, the repeal of the Trump administration rule uh, has the effect not only of um, uh, getting rid of what the Trump administration did, but in effect reinstalling the Obama administration rule, because the Trump rule replaced the Obama rule by repealing the Trump rule, the prior baseline uh, is established. So this is a this is an example, clear example of using the CRA in a way, in a in a pro-regulatory way right? to undo a deregulatory move in a way that restores the prior baseline of more stringent regulation and, and also wipes out uh, the, the Trump administration's interpretation of the Clean Air Act uh, that could have been used to make it harder for the EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions going forward. Uh, there are two possible legal issues to watch with regard to this. And, and, and it's certainly possible that we will see litigation as a result of, of this particular use of the Congressional Review Act. First, uh, it, there, there are at least some questions about this, this idea that undoing a rule springs uh, a, a prior rule back into, into force. I do think that's the way, given the way the Trump administration rule was written and done, I do think that is the effect here. Uh, but it's certainly possible that we could see litigation challenging that, challenging uh, the idea that the Obama administration rule comes back into force as opposed to there simply being no rule at all. Um, I, I'd be skeptical of such a legal challenge, but um, uh, uh, we may see such a legal challenge. And, and as with any legal challenge, we'd want to see the arguments that are put forward uh, should such a case be filed. Um, this was also a rule where there really was a debate about, okay, if this is done, and say the Biden administration or a future Harris administration or a future uh, Ocasio-Cortez administration wants to adopt a new methane rule that's even more stringent than the Obama rule, would this repeal get in the way of that? Uh, and for reasons we've already talked about, I think the answer is no, but I think this is a context in which uh, any a future more aggressive uh, regulatory measure targeting methane from oil and gas uh, development would be an appealing target uh, to test uh, to, to test the scope of the uh, substantially the same bar uh, on on reissuing regulations. And so uh, you know of the three, I think this might be the one uh, that might be the most likely uh, to prompt uh, regulation or 
could prompt litigation to help flesh out at least what the judicial understanding of the Congressional Review Act is. The last thing about this methane rules is the Biden administration has said that climate change is one of its um, uh, biggest priorities. Um, it uh, has said that it wants legislation, but other than an infrastructure bill that will have lots of goodies uh, and lots of spending spread around the country to, to help facilitate its passage, it's not clear how much appetite there is in Congress right now for a bill that would focus on the regulation of greenhouse gas emissions as opposed to funding infrastructure. And so if the Biden administration is going to fulfill its campaign promises to push for more stringent regulation of greenhouse gas emissions, the only option it really has is to use the regulatory process. Uh, and um, clearing the deck of the Trump rule, both substantively, the fact that the Trump rule had had uh, exempted a lot of oil and gas uh, producers and or, and uh, imposed fewer restrictions on greenhouse gas emissions from oil and gas production, as well as clearing the, the prior administration's narrower interpretation of the Clean Air Act, it was really essential for the Biden administration. They really needed to get this rule out of the way uh, if they're going to uh, try and use the Clean Air Act more aggressively uh, to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. They're still going to have a long, arduous process uh, to do that. It's still going to be a very legally vulnerable process. Um, I, I've written some things pointing out that uh, the courts have been um, somewhat skeptical of aggressive interpretations of the Clean Air Act to justify expansive regulation of greenhouse gas emissions. But from the standpoint of the Biden administration, if this is something they want they want to do, if they want to see more regulation of greenhouse gas emissions, it was really important for them uh, to get this rule out of the way uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and so I think that is part of the reason why uh, this was one of the three rules that was ultimately targeted. So I will stop there and turn it back over to you, Todd, and, and certainly happy to, to address any questions that we're starting to get uh, through the Q&A. Thank you. And I'll turn it back to Evelyn, who will give people instructions again on, um, on how to submit to two options to submit questions. And I think she has agreed to, to help us uh, um, identify people in the queue and read the questions to us. Great, thank you. Thank you both for your comments. This is very interesting. Um, at this time, I would just remind the audience, if you have a question, you can either enter it into the Q&A or if you'd like to raise your hand, then I can unmute your mic and you can ask the question verbally. So we will start with, You know, I think the same person who submitted some questions in the Q&A is also raising his hand. So I will just unmute Mr. Carlos Carpi and you can ask your questions verbally. Oh, thank you very much. This is absolutely great. Um, I was uh, um, wanted to ask two questions, but maybe the most important one was um, as, as first of all, I don't speak for the, the World Bank in any way, shape or form. Um, and uh, this transition and stability, particularly say the true lending uh, regulations um, and these kinds of, you know, uh, uh, lack of clarity during these usages um, and then substantive delays in getting regulation through in a time where there seems to be a lot in the agenda for the financial sector. Um, the, 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 I think the, the, the first question is, um, do you think that the, it will come from the financial sector, some of the clarity from the CRA, because maybe it has the kinds of resources to litigate this at the, at the highest level? And, and the, the um, related question to that would be, um, how should uh, international organizations understand this kind of instability? What fuels the vacuum over the years? Because there's a lot of technology and climate regulation coming down the, the pipe that, you know, will substantively change. The train is not is moving a little fast, right? I mean, it's global in some sense. And it would be great to understand how the, the you should be thinking about this on the uh, regulatory agenda side. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'll. I'll... I'll try to take a stab first and hopefully Jonathan will have more to say than I do. Um, but as far as whether I, I agree with one of your premises that the financial industry generally has the resources to, to challenge these things, um, but 
The fact of the matter is there is no, and, and maybe we should have clarified, there's no judicial review over actually enacted um, resolutions of disapproval. There is a bar on judicial review um, that the courts have um, wrestled with the scope of. Um, at Pacific Legal Foundation, we've litigated to try to establish that there is judicial review of agencies' failure to submit rules and that there is would be judicial review over some of the questions that Jonathan Adler raised, which is what is the effect of, of the resolutions of disapproval in special cases. For example, if you try to reissue uh, another rule, there's a CRA, uh, I'm sorry, Congressional Research Service um, paper that suggests that that's a, one that may evade the judicial review bar, but there is a pretty clear judicial um, bar on consideration of whether the repeal of the rule is effective if a majority of Congress uses expedited procedures um, to overturn it. And, and I would say that when Congress, a majority of both houses of Congress use procedures, um, there is a constitutional bar as well as a statutory bar on a court second guessing something that we all recognize as a law. So I, th there were a few attempts by um, CBD to challenge some of the rules overturned in the Trump administration. They, they fell pretty flat, um, uh, appropriately so. Um, so I, I think there, uh, I, I can't sort of imagine the type of claim that the financial service sector could bring with respect to the true lender rule. But since that was another one that Jonathan <laughs> mentioned, uh, was covering, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to him. Um, I will mention that if someone doesn't like the conciliation process um, that EEOC reverts to with the conciliation rule, they can still sue under the statute, under Title VII or the Age Discrimination Act, um, but they, won't have the benefit of the the Trump rule. I don't think they'll be able to challenge that the Trump rule is still in effect. So Jonathan, what other thoughts do you have, particularly on the environmental instability and international point? Yeah, no, a few thoughts. I mean, first, um, you know, in addition, on the question of judicial review, in addition to the language in the Congressional Review Act, as a general matter of courts accept Congress's characterization of what Congress has done as being binding and uh, even in the absence of a, a limitation on judicial review, the likelihood of a federal court, for example, telling Congress that it counted a session days improperly in deciding what regulation could be repealed through this process or not, that's the sort of uh, judgment that courts aren't going to make. And, and we've seen both the DC Circuit and that the Supreme Court decisions in a wide range of contexts where the courts have said, look, we're going to trust Congress's claim. So uh, on the question of recess appointments, the Supreme Court saying, look, if Congress says they're in recess, they're in recess uh, in the D.C. Circuit uh, for the purposes of something called the enrolled bill rule. The D.C. Circuit saying if Congress says this is what the bill that was enrolled, then that's what we're accepting. Kind of the legislature determines whether the legislature followed the legislature's rules. And so the likelihood of challenging those procedural aspects of the CRA, I, I don't think that that there's really much prospect of that, that, that courts are not going to be very sympathetic to those claims. If a majority of Congress is going to say, we have the authority to, to repeal this and are enacting this resolution, which is a form of legislation, and the president signs it, it's good to go. Uh, the, the sort of litigation you might get is over how what the how, what the scope of the, of the effect of that resolution is, uh, but not whether or not the resolution was passed. On the uncertainty point, you know, I think yes, it is true that the prospect of policies ping ponging back and forth can create a degree of instability or uncertainty, and that this matters uh, in certain industries. And, and there's no question about that. I'm skeptical that the CRA actually adds all that much uncertainty to that process. Uh, for one, it is, hasn't been used all that much. In 25 years, it's been used a grand total of 20 times, 21 times. Um, uh, you know, it's, it hasn't been used all that, or maybe it's 19 times. Anyway, it, it hasn't been used all that many times um, uh, across the board, all regulatory subjects. Um, Congress always has the ability to repeal 
regulations. This just makes it easier. It allows Congress to do so with less obstruction, which matters now, given that we have a Congress that is particularly um, uh, dysfunctional or, or where, where both parties are very reluctant to allow the other party to legislate. Um, uh, the CRA is, is in some respects more useful now, but we, we've seen in all sorts of contexts that when Congress wants to act quickly, uh, it can, and it can change policy quite dramatically if it wants. And that, that's true with or, without the, with or without the CRA. And certainly when agencies do things that are legally vulnerable, courts can strike them down sometimes quite quickly um, uh, you know, with a temporary injunction or a preliminary injunction in some cases. So I, I'm not convinced that, that the, pro, the CRA as a general matter creates uh, you know, systemic uncertainty. I think if a particular regulation is particularly controversial, um, the prospect of CRA repeal, just like the prospect of judicial challenge, does create uncertainty about that particular rule. And that's that's something that we we see and I think is in part a function of, of the decline of regular lawmaking by Congress. That is, if, if we're concerned about um, whether or not we can be sure that new policies when they are adopted will be stable and secure over a long period of time, that's an argument for getting Congress to legislate affirmatively more often in the first place. Uh, uh, it's not really an argument, in my view at least, uh, against the, the Congressional Review Act. And, and I would say that's true, not merely in the financial sector, but especially in areas like environmental law, where Congress has been incredibly reluctant to enact new legislation or uh, amend old legislation, right? So the, the Clean Air Act, the primary statute used to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, hasn't been revised meaningfully in 30 years. The idea that there haven't been significant changes in our understanding of air pollution and sources of air pollution and our understanding of how to control air pollution and what sorts of air pollution we should control hasn't changed in 30 years is just crazy, right? But Congress hasn't acted. And, and that's the sort of thing we should be looking at in, in the financial sector, especially if you're talking about fintech, same sort of thing. Statutory framework has not kept up, kept pace with technological changes. In the telecommunications context, same thing, right? The last big telecom law is what, 96? Um, Congress needs to be in the game more. Uh, and I think that that is the way you get less uncertainty because you will have statutes that actually address current problems. So we know that the statutory framework is more stable and that regulations adopted under that framework will have firmer legislative grounding than what happens now, which is agencies dig up 30 year old statutes to try and deal with contemporary problems. And there's often a mismatch. And that creates uncertainty, uh, not merely because of things like the CRA, but more importantly, because it creates a fertile ground for litigation. And I think that creates broader uh, uncertainty uh, than the CRA does. So that was a, a long answer. And I hope, I hope that addressed uh, uh, Mr. Carby's concerns. Great, thank you both. We'll now move to the next question from William Trackman. He asks if a regulation becomes effective that repeals previously previously enacted regulation, old rec. Let's <laughs> start that again. If a regulation becomes effective that appeals previously enacted old regulations, does a CRA repeal of the new regulation bring back to life the old regulations? I'm happy to start if you want, Todd. Yeah, please. Yeah, you can. The answer is um, the short answer is we think so, but it depends. So. Why we think so is, is that if you view the regulation as a discrete agency action, anything that undoes that regulation, whether it's a new rulemaking, uh, a congressional action, or a court judgment, typically has the effect of, an, of erasing that action and restoring the prior baseline. I say it depends because sometimes agencies repeal an old rule and adopt a new regulation in, in stages or in sequences. And so sometimes it really it will, will depend on what it is that is actually the subject of the resolution of disapproval. In the case of the methane regulation, um, uh, Congress treated what the Trump administration did as a single action, a single regulatory rulemaking that did a few things, repealed the Obama rule, adopted a replacement, that created exemptions and adopted certain interpretations of the Clean Air Act. And so that whole package 
is what Congress claims to have uh, rescinded with the CRA resolution of disapproval and that President Biden signed. And uh, while I noted that it's, it's certainly possible we might get a legal challenge to that, if I had to handicap that, I would say that Congress's understanding of what was done with that rule uh, is, is likely to be upheld. And in that case, that restores the prior baseline of, uh, of the Obama rule. That is to say, what the Trump administration did to change the Code of Federal Regulations has been undone, and the prior state of the relevant provisions of the Code of Re Federal Regulations has been restored. But again, there could be contexts, right, where an administration does something in stages. It first does a rule, getting rid of the, of the prior administration's rule. It then does a separate rule. Kind of the new, and, and in that context, Congress would probably have to go after both uh, in order to have that same effect. And, that, and that's certainly something that, that we should watch for in the future. Uh, there have been a few examples of agencies strategically trying to cut up regulatory actions into, into constituent parts uh, so as to either make CRA repeal more difficult or to make litigation uh, more difficult. And, and we could certainly see that sort of thing going forward as well. I, I um, again, agree with Jonathan, but I'll just add a couple of, of um, side notes. Um, it's possible that an agency could successfully gain the situation by doing the repeal rule early enough in the process. And then the second rule so that the first rule is not within the expedited repeal window um, and that only the second rule is within the repeal window. But maybe uh, I should have begun with the premise. This question is made somewhat clearer and why I think Jonathan is right, because the, the original Congressional Review Act has a provision. And I used to be able to quote, you know, subsection whatever, um, uh, when, when I was uh, uh, studying this kind of stuff, but it says, if a rule is repealed, it shall, and here I'm paraphrasing from memory, um, it shall be treated if it was never in effect. So without that provision, there would be, I think, additional uncertainty as to whether the, a repeal uh, brings back the prior status quo. Um, but I think with that provision of the Congressional Review Act, at least in most cases, um, it's, a, it's a clear instruction that uh, the 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 it's the courts must treat the world as if the repealed rule never existed. So, so given the facts of the methane rule, as Jonathan has has related, the methane rule was the instrument that repealed the Obama rule. If it doesn't exist, the Obama rule is still in existence. Now the Additional questions I submit that are subject probably to litigation are, okay, if that means that the Obama rule now is viewed as being continuously in effect, but not really in effect for three and a half years, what about violations during that three and a half year period? And I submit agencies hopefully will exercise discretion not to bring that because it, I, would, I would bring a due process claim. I would bring a due process claim to say, okay, for most intents and purposes going forward, we will treat the Obama rule as always being in effect. But it really wasn't for three and a half years. So you can't bring your enforcement action against me. But we'll see, probably see citizen suits, right? Right, uh, Jonathan? Uh, would you imagine citizen suits that might try to bring enforcement actions against people who didn't obey the Obama? Uh, uh, um, I mean, it depends on, on, I mean, under the Clean Air Act, could you do something like that? Yeah, uh, you could try. Um, I wouldn't think they would get very far. I mean, in, in general, and I'm oversimplifying, in the environmental statutes, um, there are ways for uh, the EPA to essentially oust uh, uh, citizen suits if there's no claim that the EPA is violating the law as well. But um, we might see a test, a test case of that sort. It's certainly possible. Great. I think that part of the next question from Jeffrey Wood has been answered. So I think perhaps I'll just focus your your discussion on the question of what if a new rule modifies only parts of several prior rules and adds new rules that were not addressed before. So I think that gets to the scope of the repeal, if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, well, the Congressional Review Act might be amended in the future, but the Congressional Review Act passed 25 years ago doesn't allow 
Um, oh, I see. But if a new rule only modifies part of uh, the Congressional Review Act only allows, by the way, Congress to repeal an entire rule. So the Congressional Review Act doesn't allow Congress to pick and choose which parts to repeal. But if the new rule only modified parts, then in Congress um, repeals that, then those parts that were modified um, leap back into existence. Um, uh, I think that's kind of the abstract answer, but it's always a little more um, you know, concrete to have, have examples. Maybe Jonathan has thought through the hypothetical better than me as a, as a law professor. Well, I mean, it's certainly a question of, of, of that we could see. So just to give kind of a, a, an example of something similar that we saw in the Obama administration, um, when the Obama administration was first adopting regulations governing greenhouse gases from, from traditional stationary sources, right, from, from utilities, um, it was concerned by the fact that uh, adopting the Clean Air Act's numerical emission thresholds to greenhouse gases would increase the universe of regulated firms by orders of magnitude. And the Obama administration knew that, that just from an administrative standpoint, that would create a mess. There, was, there would be no way for the EPA or state regulatory agencies to process that many permit applications. But the Obama administration wanted to begin the process of subjecting at least the largest of these firms to greenhouse gas regulation. And, um, but they had this problem, there are numerical thresholds in the statute. So they came up with this idea of, of adopting this regulation in multiple pieces, in part so as to make it more difficult for regulated entities to sue. So you have what we referred to as the timing and tailoring rules. Um, one was a rule about when the, these, the obligations to control greenhouse gas emissions would take effect, and then a separate rule would then exempt the vast majority of firms caught by the statutory threshold from complying with the regulation. And their theory was is that um, the timing rule was safe uh, from a statutory interpretation standpoint. It was a fairly straightforward uh, or was, was safer, but the exemption was more legally questionable, but because it was relieving regulatory burdens, it would be harder for firms to challenge it because you generally can't sue saying you're regulating other people too little or my competitors too little. Uh, and the DC circuit initially bought that argument and said no stand it and, and accepted the, C the EPA strategic move. The Supreme Court, I think correctly, um, didn't allow the EPA's gamesmanship to, to survive. You could see something similar here, right? So let's say a future administration says, we want to reimpose this rule that Congress had repealed with the CRA, we know if we just adopt the same rule or the same rule, but 10% more stringent say, that that's, that's a sitting duck. That's an incredibly vulnerable target. But what if we adopt a regulation that's broader? So let's say uh, for methane emissions, um, uh, and this, uh, you know, or, or, or something like that, we're gonna adopt a rule that's not just about oil and gas facilities, but we're, it's about a broader range of industries. Um, and we are going to replicate the repealed rules approach to oil and gas, but we're, it, it's one rule that also deals with other sources of other similar types of emissions. Could we now say, well, because this big rule is not substantially the same because it has all these other parts, are we somehow immune from the CRA bar? And that would present, I think, a really interesting legal question because on the one hand, you would say, well, it's a much broader, more extensive, more expansive regulatory action. It's not substantially the same. But on the other hand, we might recognize that what the agency is doing is precisely what the CRA is, is written to try and prevent, which is circumventing the effect of a congressional resolution of disapproval. Uh, and and we, I would not be surprised if at some point we see an administration try and do something like that. And, you know, as a law professor, I'll, I'll follow that, that litigation very eagerly because I'll be very curious to see what the courts do. But, but I, I think that that sort of thing is definitely, definitely plausible. And, and I would not be at all surprised to see something like that in the future. And as a public interest litigation firm, we might uh, decide to try to sue to make Jonathan's life more interesting. Right. A very symbiotic relationship, great. Um, I think, and I'll, I'll allow you to decide if 
if this has already been answered, but has the CRA been tested in as far as constitutional validity? Um, there are limits on Congress's ability to weigh in on regulations that are promulgated by Article II agencies. So has the CRA been tested as to constitutional validity? So for example, a signature by the president of a congressional veto of a regulation resolves the problem. Short answer is it does resolve the problem. So I think what the question is um, alluding to is there's a case we always teach in law school. Uh, some people get it in con law. We usually cover it in administrative law or in legislation and regulation. Uh, INS versus Chadha, which in which the Supreme Court struck down what was called the unicameral legislative veto. So Congress had, uh, and it used this in hundreds of statutes, had created a mechanism in the past to allow one House of Congress by itself to pass a resolution disapproving of an agency action and to have that nullify the agency action. And it wasn't just used for regulations, it was used for all sorts of things. In the case of Chada, it was a suspension of an order of removal uh, for an immigrant, um, uh, or I guess for an unlawfully present alien uh, in, in that case. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional because bicameralism and presentment wasn't satisfied, that Congress in delegating power to an agency had created a legal baseline and that if Congress wants to undo that delegation of power, even just a tiny little bit by voiding a, an action, it would have to go through bicameralism and presentment again. What the Congressional Review Act does and was clearly written to do was to say, okay, um, we have to go through bicameralism and presentment. This resolution has to be passed by both houses of Congress. It has to be signed by the president, but there's nothing in INS versus Chana that tells Congress how to internally structure its rules in, in doing that. In fact, the Constitution expressly gives to each chamber in Congress the exclusive authority to determine its own, their own internal rules. And so what the CRA just says is we're just going to make it easier for Congress to do or to fulfill the constitutional process of bicameralism and presentment. And I do think there were some you know, district court challenges, some challenges filed in the two district courts trying to claim that somehow the CRA still was constitutionally infirm. Those cases did not go anywhere. Um, uh, I, there, there, there's some group that I occasionally see on Twitter that still makes these arguments, but um, I, I don't think they're, they're, they're ever going anywhere um, because it's pretty clear that if something goes through bicameralism and presentment, then bicameralism and presentment have been satisfied. Absolutely. There was a couple of wild claims that tried to say that once certain regulatory power was delegated to the agencies, Congress couldn't intervene even with a, with a new law, which is effectively as uh, uh, what the CRA resolution of disapproval is. Uh, we intervened in one of them. Um, it, as Jonathan said, did not go anywhere and, and the Ninth Circuit uh, didn't, uh, didn't make it a, didn't think it was a very hard, hard uh, question. And that was uh, before most of the Trump appointees joined the Ninth Circuit too. So if, if you, if you lose, um, in the Ninth Circuit or that time of the Ninth Circuit, you know your your claim is pretty worthless. I don't know if we have uh, time for one more, um, Evelyn. If, if the two of you don't have a hard stop, then we can certainly answer a final question. Sure. Okay, great. Um, so again, for Mr. Carpey, the could you comment on the scope issues of CRA and oversight functions? Again, the financial industry the chief source of concern is regulatory arbitrage and regulatory backsliding within the banking industry. The scope seems to be the heart of the matter from those looking from the outside. So for example, what financial oversight is a rule and thus subject to CRA procedure. For example, the CRA was a subject of controversy in 2017 when the GAO determined that the leverage lending ratio was a rule. So it had to follow the procedural requirements of the CRA and the fund had a few reports on the matter. Um, I, I can take a stab at that. Um, the uh, sponsors uh, and, and drafters of the CRA uh, define rule extremely broadly, even more broadly than the type of rules that must get notice and comment, um, because they, they didn't want the agencies to sort of game the congressional review opportunity. And the um, the CRA actually serves an additional purpose than actually having Congress overturn rules, um, but it actually provided a database just of how many rules there are. 
And for many years uh, under the CRA, um, there were a number of studies by GAO and, and others that agencies were not interpreting the CRA correctly and submitting as many things as were required uh, to Congress. Um, but OMB has issued various guidances uh, along the way, uh, trying to nudge the agencies to do so. And I think the experience that Congress had, particularly with a rule that this um, CFPB uh, uh, guidance document did not send to Congress uh, has been further um, helpful in nudging the agencies um, to interpret the definition of rule broadly. In, in that case, um, Congress uh, deemed that uh, CFPB should have sent the rule to Congress and deemed it to be submitted. I don't agree with that particular process, um, but as Jonathan said, uh, Congress decides its own uh, procedure and it includes the Congressional Review Act. So it can, it can decide uh, when a rule uh, has been submitted or is deemed submitted. Um, and it in fact used the expedited procedures uh, to overturn that uh, uh, CFPB uh, rule. So I'm not, I, th I think that uh, answers at least the heart of the uh, question. Uh, Jonathan may have some other understanding and, and he can have the last word. No, I'll just add uh, uh, and I agree with, with what Todd said. I mean, the, the, the CRA does adopt a broad understanding of rule. Um, and if Congress believes something is a rule subject to the CRA, Congress's conclusion on that point is going to is going to hold sway. So if Congress uses this procedure and uh, invalidates something that the agency thought was a guidance or the agency thought was a notice or something else, but Congress says no, looks like a rule, has the function of a rule, we're treating it like a rule, Congress is going to prevail. Um, uh, agency authority comes from delegations of power from Congress. Um, Congress can take that power back or, or veto the use of that authority uh, as it wants to. Um, that said, there is, I think, a, a recognition that um, not only that agencies may try and play some games um, with what's a rule versus what's a guidance. This has been a longstanding concern in administrative law. What my students know that we, when we talk about what's a legislative rule versus an interpretive rule, which affects whether or not the rule has to go through notice and comment. Uh, what if it's a policy statement? What if it's a, a guidance? What if it's something else that's not even mentioned in the APA? And you know, agencies play games with that to try and take advantage of exemptions uh, from various procedural requirements. And, and that continues, I think, with the CRA as well. Um, the Administrative Conference of, of the United States actually is, has an RFP out looking at possible technical amendments to the CRA, or things that don't really change the substance, but that on the margin may just clarify some things. And one of the things that, that um, ACUS has identified as a, a possible subject of technical amendment is, is something that would formalize the process for identifying uh, things that uh, agencies don't think are rules subject to the CRA, but that Congress might think are rules subject to the CRA as a way of providing greater certainty uh, there. Um, uh, but, um, you know, agencies sometimes don't want to play by the rules. Uh, that's not a Republican or Democratic thing. It's just, you know, agencies sometimes want to achieve what they think their mission is to achieve. And, um, sometimes skirt, try and skirt the rules to do that. And um, you know, the CRA didn't really change that. And, and there are places where on the margin where that can happen under the CRA, such as an agency trying to characterize something as a guidance or a policy statement or a policy manual or a dear colleague letter or whatever else that we would all recognize as having the, the form and function of a rule. Great. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Thanks for listening. The CRA um, it becomes especially important. Um, well, lately, every four years, sometimes every eight years. I did want to mention in response to something that Jonathan said. It was actually used for the first and only time in 2001, and then there was a long drought in 2017. Um, but I think he's also uh, correct that now that uh, 
Um, it's been used by both sort of ideological sides. It's here to stay. And so uh, we're, we're glad to, to try to uh, talk about the implications and, and maybe you won't have to hear from us again for four or eight years. I'll just say, you know, I agree with that, 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 you know, the, the, the CRA's legitimacy, I think now, and, and it's accepted, it being an accepted part of administrative law is greater now that it's been used by both Republican and Democratic Congresses. I think that's good um, because I think the CRA is a, a small mechanism that um, encourages and in some cases forces members of Congress to uh, indicate whether or not they support or oppose the regulatory measures that are being adopted by agencies. And I think that's a good thing purely from the standpoint of, of democratic accountability for the things that agencies do. And um, seeing the CRA as a, a one small way on the margin that helps keep agencies within uh, the, the scope of their delegated authority you know, is a good thing. And um, you know, I look forward to seeing it being used uh, in various directions by various administrations and, and Congresses in the future. Great, thank you. And on behalf of the Federalist Society, I wanna thank both of you, our experts today for the benefit of your valuable time and expertise. And I wanna thank our audience for participating and sending in your questions. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails about announcements about upcoming teleform calls and virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>